All right, welcome to this episode of Photo Theology. I'm your host, Doug, and today we are continuing our conversation on skin tones. Da -da -da! Yeah, that's right. Um, so yeah, we're, we're continuing the conversation. Uh, today I'll be probably uploading like four videos. So literally, <clears throat> sorry, literally, there we go, literally, you'll be able to listen to these things like back to back to back to back to back. It's going to be like one of those kind of deals. Uh, I, I honestly planned on just doing audios and spacing them out um, and giving you it section by section by section, basically part by part by part. And the reason why I didn't ultimately end up doing it was more or less just the fact of the kind of conversation that it was and stuff like that. And where I felt that as someone was really engaged in listening to what this essential, you know, theme is all about for these past couple of episodes, then they're going to want to have a good bulk of information all collected, you know, into, uh, one lineup. So that's basically, you know, the way I decided to go about this. Now, the truth is also, I probably could have just taken all these videos and combined them together as one crazy long video, which I might actually do, uh, when it's all said and done. So if somebody just wants to listen to it from beginning to end, they can do that without, you know, jumping from, you know, part one to part two, to part three, to part four. But be that as it may, if I did that, that'd be like, you know, down the line in the future, uh, be that as it may, um, we are now to a completely different segment than where we've been. Okay. So what have we talked about so far? Uh, just to recap real quickly, we've talked about how people see themselves when it comes to skin tones. We've talked about, you know, the whole concept of how dark chocolate wants to be lighter chocolate and white chocolate wants to be darker chocolate. You know, we've already talked about that stuff. You know, we've talked about, you know, organic versus, you know, dynamic, you know, authentic versus artificial. We, we talked about those things. Uh, we've also talked about the kind of advice that you should be looking for in terms of a conversational piece, you know? Um, so when someone's up, when someone's having a conversation with you about, you know, camera gear and essentially what's going to be good for you versus what's not going to be good for you. Okay. Beyond what we have in terms of this conversation or these series of conversations, you know, we talked about the kind of things you should be looking for, namely not so much about what they believe one manufacturers or a series of manufacturers products are going to do for you, but it's what the other products don't do for you that you need. You know, so we talked about that. And then of course, uh, you know, we began to talk about, you know, technologies, technologies. So I had told you guys that the easiest way to capitalize on the concept of skin tones and to be able to nail it right out of the box, a cheap and a, or a cheap and inexpensive way with high accuracy is of course, C our, um, CCD based units. You know, such as, you know, uh, Fuji and their, you know, uh, S, S number pro series, whether it's, you know, a three or a five or arguably even a two, I guess you could say, uh, you could do that. Um, you have the Fuji, the, you know, S 100, you've got that. Um, and then of course we could go, you know, on and on and on about, you know, other manufacturers, uh, as well, aside from Fuji, but I, I centered it around essentially Fuji when it came to, uh, you know, CCD. And one thing I want to point out, the reason why, you know, I did that was to give you guys some, you know, gear and tech to deal with, because I think it's really important that, you know, it's one thing to sit up here and look at methodologies, you know, and we had talked about that, you know, in, in the past where, you know, methodologies is, you know, pri primarily what it's all about. You got to have a methodology to something if, if you want to, you know, follow through with it with consistency and with a, with a belief of understanding. But at some point, the dollars have got to be shelled out. And at some point, you know, products have got to give results. So like I told you, if you are a beginning photographer and you don't own virtually any gear or you're looking to switch up in gear and, you know, you're on a budget, then CCD is totally the way to go. Now I gave you one type of technology, which was the Fuji, um, 
super CCD HR. And that's exactly what I would do if I were going for skin tones um, or portraiture photography. But I'll go further than that now um, in, in this conversation. And, and, and what we're going to look at now is we're going to look at um, other different ways. You know, so like if you didn't go Fuji, well, then Doug, how would it work? You know, how, how can you make it work for you? Um, because some people aren't going to do Fuji. They won't do Fuji um, that are going to listen to this because they may believe that, hey, I, I already own a ton of Canon equipment. I, I already own a ton of, you know, um, you know, Pentex equipment. Or I, I already own, you know, a ton of, uh, you know, whatever it is, Sony, Panasonic, Olympus, you name it. Yeah, it's out there. So when we talk about, you know, other manufacturers and stuff like that, I, I want to make it clear. Fuji is a great manufacturer. Um, they're not the only manufacturer, though. Um, because when it comes to skin tones and it comes to portraiture, the one that you could arguably make gives Fuji the run for the money, or you may even believe is better than Fuji is Sigma. Now, some of you may be wondering what on earth is Doug talking about Sigma? Well, for those of you who don't know, Sigma actually, you know, sells SLRs, um, now or digital SLRs, I should say. Uh, it's called their, um, SD series. So they have like an SD 14, SD 15, so on and so forth. And Sigma has what's called the Foveon processor. Now the Foveon processor is one of my uh, favorite processors. It is. And I, I've actually, you know, used uh, Sigma before, you know, so this is coming from a person who has experience with Sigma and, you know, as far as Sigma goes, what makes them so unique is this, is that Sigma can take a CCD or a CMOS uh, system. They can take either one and they can deliver for you the color, tones, and textures for portraiture or landscape. They can give you that real authenticity that not only would you expect out of maybe a full frame SLR, but even a medium format, dare I say, but I'll say it. So what makes Sigma so amazing, but at the same time, it, it ends up being its Achilles heel is their Foveon system. The idea behind the Foveon system is this, is that you have basically think of it as like a tri sensor system. Okay where you've got one sensor that is of one primary color, then layered underneath it is another sensor of a primary color. And then later underneath that is another sensor of a primary color. Think of it like that if you want to. Okay. Cause I think that's just going to be the easiest way without getting into the weeds, uh, the technological weeds of what the Foveon processor is to explain that to you guys. Now, what I love about the Foveon processor, and, and, and we will do a whole, a whole segment on that at some point in the future, is the fact that it uses a primary color system and basically think of it like this. Think about light being shot through the actual sensor, okay? As the you know, light is traveling through, what happens is based on how the primary, you know, the... Uh, the primary color system is laid out, the respective, you know, um, signatures will stop at their, you know, given paths. So what that means is red stops at red, green stops at green, and then blue stops at blue. Essentially that's, that's, that's how it works, you know? So what makes this so amazing is a Sigma has the ability to, and, and they were really, I would say the first brand to get high resolution images aside, probably Pentex, um, out of <clears throat> crop sensor cameras, um, in a legitimate format. But what's really amazing with them and how they work is they can take a four megapixel based sensor and through their Foveon system, they can come out with like 14 megapixels. You know, they have the ability to do so. But also, because they use a tri-layer system of coloring in terms of, you know, basically light absorption. The other advantage that they get is they get a truer palette of color. And in addition to getting a true palette of color, 
your textures and your tones also play into it as well. So what's really beautiful about Sigma as a brand is their accuracy is essentially dead on. Or to the human eye, it has that feel of utmost accuracy. Now, when I think of Sigma in today's market, the way I would think of them, if you were talking about their Foveon system, uh, one of the best ways to look at them would be like a brand, like a higher end, like a camera. Like if you were talking like, for example, um, a, uh, a Leica, you know, type 601. Okay. Think about a camera like that. Now, now what I mean by that is... When I'm saying a higher end like a camera, I'm not talking about a camera that's like, you know, fifty or sixty thousand dollars. Okay, no, that, that's not what I'm talking about. That's, you know, you might might as well be a medium format system at that point that we're talking. But what I'm talking about is a higher end, you know, SLR, digital SLR, that's still conventional in the consumer's market. So if I were putting it in today's terms, that's the way I, I'd put it. They give that kind of output. However, for Sigma, their weakness is of course um, their Foveon system. And the reason why it is, is because Sigma primarily deals with surface quality. That's what they do. Because they use a tri layered sensor absorption, um, or light absorption uh, system with primary colors. The problem that they run into is where let's say their image quality is for the sake of the conversation four to 16 times better on the baseline than their, you know, given conventional Nikon or Canon, a competitor. Well, that also means that their noise control is just as bad. And what I mean by that is this, is that with this kind of system, when you talk about the Foveon system, you, you get into a situation where if the Foveon would be a plus three in, you know, a zero to whatever plus exposure you want to give it in terms of its, its ISO performance, then if it's, if it's a plus three there compared to the average DSLR, then it's low light shooting performance in terms of ISO ranges and stuff like that are a minus three as well. So th with the Foveon system, although it projects great image quality and although it does a, a magnificent, and I mean magnificent job when it comes to portraiture um, and, and, and uh, you know, just landscapes and you name it. And it's dynamic range is on the mark. It's good stuff. The only drawback is, of course, it is not a um, low light shooting camera. Now the Foveon system, and, and, and you're gonna hear me uh, say this now, and this is gonna be a rarity when you hear me say this. The Foveon system from Sigma is probably about the only exception I ever give to, to a camera that cannot shoot in low light or is not meant to do so. Now the reason why I give this camera a pass, and I normally will not do this because if you've ever listened to me in previous conversations, you know I am a low light whore. You know, it's it, for me, I'm all about shooting at ISOs at 6,400 and, and what have you not, uh, 5,064, um, so on and so forth. When you're talking Sigma, you gotta keep in mind, you might be only talking with a camera like that, 1,600 ISO, and at 800, it's, it's pretty much done. Okay, so the way it works with the Foveon system is it projects you know, medium format quality, you know, it projects such outlandish, well-lit quality that when you drop below a certain ISO range, and I would say a lot of it really does have to do with the environment that you're in, because you have to look at dynamic noise as well in lower lit situations, it falls to pieces. Now, what's amazing about the Sigma system is that the Foveon system does work extremely well with dynamic lighting in well-lit situations. So one of the other reasons why I love the Sigma system is the Sigma system does not compromise its performance in the way that it goes about 
delivering image quality from a dynamic exposure perspective. It doesn't do that. And this is one of the coolest things about how Sigma works. And this is one of the reasons why I love them more than most other cameras. Now, the thing that you got to keep in mind here is that with Sigma, there is essentially a price to pay. There is. And quite frankly, you have to understand that that price is low light shooting performance. Like you're not going to be able to get great low light shooting performance out of a Sigma SD based series camera. It's not going to happen. It will never happen because that's not their primary goal when it comes to developing uh, cameras. But what I will say is this, is that with the Sigma, the thing you want to keep in mind is that what will make them unique is the fact that in terms of well-lit performance, in terms of controlled lighting, or in terms of natural you know, daylight uh, lighting, there is going to be nothing that is essentially going to be able to match their output in that given, you know, that given type of scenario. And this is, uh, for, for what they offer, I should say. Um, and this is what makes them very unique. It does. Um, I have dealt with Sigma, Mato or, I'm sorry. I've dealt with Sigma photographers before. I was about to say photographers, like there's no such thing as a photographer. Photographers. I've dealt with them before. I've used Sigma myself before. And I will definitely say that the Foveon system is a really, 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 really good system. It is. So I, that is my, if you don't go Fuji and technologically, you want to have something that is inherently different, then you got to go Sigma and you got to go Foveon. But you got to understand the Fuji system and the, and the Sigma system are two totally opposite ends of the spectrum. You know, um, with the Fuji system, it's all about lower resolutions and capitalizing on dynamic range and dynamic exposures with great, you know, low light shooting and well lit uh, shooting scenarios. With Sigma, they're the complete opposite. It's all about being able to amplify resolutions. So keep in mind, Sigma can take a four megapixel sensor and they can project it to a 14, which is pretty impressive. But also with Sigma, what, what makes them really impressive um, is the fact that they are surface dynamic ranged base. They're not low light based. So what they do is they try to reinforce the front end of well lit exposures while essentially giving up on the back end of low, low lit exposures. It's what they do. And if you get in a Sigma, that's just, you take it for what it is, but they don't try to market their camera as a low light shooting camera. That's not what they do. And this is one of the things that I love about them. You know, they're not out there. Like if you go to find their stuff, which is older now, like their SD 15 or SD 14 or, or, you know, or the 10 or whatever you want to find the nine, you don't hear these guys ranting and raving about, you know, oh, we shooting this, that, or the other, or so on and so forth, you know? And if you go with some of their more recent stuff, you got to keep in mind, they build like 48 megapixel, uh, output cameras, so on and so forth as well. You know, I believe it was a uh, 48 megapixels. The last one I saw. So if you wanted something that would give you, let's say, medium format in terms of resolution, uh, you know, um, output, and you still want to retain those colors and, the, and those dynamic, you know, uh, uh, exposures and all that, and you're not trying to have your camera fall to pieces on you literally in the process of doing so, you know, you're not trying to break the image. As long as you don't want to do it from a low lit perspective, Sigma is definitely the way to go. It is totally the way to do it. Now, again, they're different from Fuji because Fuji isn't based on resolution. They would rather have lesser resolution and optimize dynamic exposures and, you know, uh, overall given performance where Sigma, of course, doesn't, doesn't feel that. They believe that, hey, you know, you can give up low light shooting. And if you give up low light shooting, you can gain a whole lot more. 
And both arguments are actually very true. Again, I love Sigma and I love Fuji and I love the Foveon system that, you know, Sigma has. And I love the super CCD system that uh, Fuji has. So for a person who is, shall we say, less experienced in the world of photography and you want to, you know, get gear essentially that is inexpensive, but can give you professional class results. As long as you can deal with, you know, a lower resolution system with, I want to say somewhat of a quote unquote restricted ISO, uh, parameter, then Fuji is the way to go. If you are looking at it from a standpoint, uh, and remember that's because they use their super CCD HR technology. If you're looking at it from a standpoint of trying to maximize resolutions and you're willing to give up low light entirely, um, then with the Foveon system, Sigma is the way to go. So that's just to give you guys a, a I want to say a real perspective on technologies here, you know, and the reason why I brought Sigma up here is that I don't want people to sit up here and think that, oh, you know what? He just talks about Fuji this and Fuji that, but clearly he's not interested in other types of technologies that are out there. No, I am interested in that, and I have dealt with other types of technologies out there. I'm just saying these are the ones that give you real leading results. They do, you know, and, and, there, and there's a huge difference between looking at a Fuji, for example, and looking like at a, at a Canon 40D, all right, or looking at a, um, a, uh, a Sigma SD 14 or 15 and, and, and looking at again, a Canon, you know, a 40 D or an icon D 90 or whatever it would be. All right. Now you got to remember the pricing of what these cameras would be. You know, these cameras in today's market would be around 500 or so, you know, and, and the thing that you got to keep in mind is that you're not going to get an icon D 3200 or 3300 and match the output and performance of those cameras. Now, the Nikon may do better in lower lit ISO, just sheer ISO performance or something like that. It may do better there, but in a well lit scenario where you would actually use that thing, okay, these other cameras that I'm talking about will blow the Nikon like 3300 or a Canon T5. It will blow those things out the water. And you got to remember, these are, are relatively high end bodies too as well. So let's just keep that part in mind. So as we go through this conversational piece here, you know, I'm still trying to stay within the realm of, of, uh, budgeting of that photographer who basically is going to spout the nonsense of, and I do believe it is nonsense, by the way, the nonsense of saying, well, I just want to start with a camera and once when I know what I'm doing, all right, that whole, that whole line there, you know, the, the BS line there, once when I know what I'm doing, I'm going to get myself a better camera. That's a load of crap. It's always been a load of crap. I always believe it's a load of crap because here's how it works. This, this is the reality of how things go. When you go to do a shoot or when you go to deal with, you know, a given event, with given subject matter. You only get that one moment in time to deal with it. You, you don't get to sit up here and say, well, I'm going to go back and reshoot this, you know, later on, unless it's a telephone pole outside and you live in an environment where it's constantly overcast and nothing ever changes, you know, and you plan on shooting that telephone pole, you know, year after year at five o'clock in the afternoon, right on the dot. Then w what a person says from that respect of, I'll start off with less expensive gear and then work my way up once when I know what I'm doing to, to higher performing gear, it's never going to hold true. It will never hold true. The key is this. If you don't feel comfortable spending a ton of money 
which I don't even consider to be a ton of money, but let's say it is a ton of money, uh, from a person's perspective that says, well, I don't want to spend a thousand dollars on a camera. Um, I mean, truthfully to be told, if you don't want to spend a thousand dollars on a camera, you probably shouldn't inspire to be a photographer. But, uh, if, if you're not willing to shell out, I'll say about 1500, I'll just go with the 1500 mark. Okay. If you're not willing to shell out, the, you know, 1500, okay. On a, I want to say medium range camera. Then what you should be looking at is a lower end price point that you feel comfortable with, but an older professional body to go to boot. That's what you ought to be doing. So when you talk about like old gear versus new gear, here's how it works. You don't say, well, I see for, for, you know, newer, newer cameras, you can get yourself like a Canon, we'll say seven D Mark two for, we'll round it off to 1900 bucks. Okay. 1900 bucks, whatever. I don't want to spend that, but I want to do, you know, landscape photography. I want to do that. Or I want to do, you know, just, uh, nature. And I'm primarily going to be dealing with moving subjects like, you know, bears and fish and, you know, eagles and whatever it's going to be, you know, and, and, and it's not going to be at the zoo. It, you know, I'm actually going to go out into the wild and actually do this. You know, again, I would sit up here and, and look at a person and say, well, if you're, if you're spending all that money on the trip, to get yourself there, you know, cause this is your passion. Then I'm quite sure when you want to get there, you want to have a, a camera body that's going to deliver the performance of, you know, what you're, what you've really intended to go after, you know? So if you're not willing to spend that $1,900 on, on that, you know, uh, seven, you know, seven D Mark two, then what you need to do is reevaluate how much are you looking to spend and then what's going to give you performance that will be somewhat within that league. That's what you would do. It's only natural. Now, when you start whittling down the price points, if you're going to say, okay, we're well, not going to do 1900 for like a body only, for example, um, cause you still got to get, you know, a long zoom lens or something like that. You know, you got to get longer zoom lenses and, and, and things of that nature. Then obviously a thousand dollars probably isn't going to work for you either. Because again, we, we look at the fact that, you know, you still need to have that longer zoom lens and you still need to have a high speed body. Then realistically, what you might be looking at is you may be looking at a body that would be within the five to seven range and then trying to capture one or two lenses, you know, hopefully you get a halfway decent kit lens, but then getting a long zoom lens, something that would range around the 400 millimeter, um, that could put you around the $1,900 price point. But when it's all said and done, if, if you can't afford the lens structure of what that body provides, or if you can't afford the body performance, or more importantly, it's not so much you can't afford, you're not willing to save your money to acquire the body performance of what you need, then there are two options you got. Option number one is go buy yourself a point and shoot camera. That's a super zoom or go buy yourself a point and shoot camera. That's going to fit within the realm of what you're going after. That's option number one. Option number two, and this is what I've been talking about this entire time is you go and find an older style of camera, an older generation of camera that still gives you great mechanics. And then of course you do whatever you're going to do on the lens end. That's what you do. You know, because you got to keep in mind, uh, you take a camera like the Canon 40 D for example, take a camera like that just for a moment in time, that camera's AF speed is as fast as the Canon 70 D or, you know, essentially as fast as the Canon, um, 70, uh, Mark twos 
A of speed in today's market. Plus, on top of that, it shoots like, you know, six frames uh, or 6.3 frames, 6.5 frames, whatever it is, a second. I mean, it, it's, it's a much older camera, but the camera's fast relatively, even in today's market. It's faster than the majority of other cameras. So if you could get your, hand, your hands on a Canon 40D, you know, you might be like, ah, hey, look what I'm able to do now, da 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 You know, and, and maybe you can get one of those for 500 bucks. Then you just get slapped with reality that if you want to have a 400 millimeter lens from Canon, it's going to run you like $2,000. So yeah, you got to deal with that stuff. You got to deal with that stuff. Um, but at least you're in part of the equation. Now, in reality, this goes back to what I had said in... I believe the second part of this whole skin tones conversation, which is if you're talking to the right person, then they'll tell you why you're going to go with this over here versus going with that over there and why that over there doesn't work. Okay. So maybe if you came to me under that scenario and said, Hey, you know what, Doug, I I've only got 1500 to spend and I know I need to have, you know, this kind of lens and this kind of lens and this kind of body to do what I want to do. What do I do? Then I say here, you know what? Instead of talking about Canon, why don't we go look at Panasonic or Olympus? Because they can give you higher performing bodies for the money, faster frame rates, faster focusing abilities. Not so much as fast as the Canon 40D. I mean, that's like an link of its own legendary camera. But anyways, fast nonetheless. And you can get yourself that 400 millimeter output, which is you know, in a crop sensor form, 600 millimeters actually, but though you can get that 400 millimeter output and you can get it around, we'll say 550 bucks or so starting off. So why don't we, why don't we go and look at those guys instead? You know, that, that's the whole thing here. And, and I know I was dealing with for a moment there, you know, uh, landscape, uh, photography. I, I know I was doing that, you know, um, you know, nature photography. And I know I was doing that and I wasn't dealing with skin tones, but that's just to, to, to give you guys a, an understanding of how this works. You know, you, you've got to understand that sometimes it's not about buying something within the current market. It's not, you know, so if you're Joe Schmo and you want to sit up here and photograph, you know, Eagles, for example, let's say you want to photograph some Eagles. Okay. Um, and, and you're basically in a situation where, although you want to photograph Eagles, you can only spend 1500 bucks. Then the smart thing to do would be to get yourself an older Olympus camera, do that, and then go off and get yourself a 300, I'm sorry, a 75 to 300 millimeter lens, which because they use a multiplier too, that gives you a 150 to, you know, 600 millimeter lens. That's what it does. But that would be the smart way to do it. Now, up until now, I haven't even talked about Olympus really in any real significant fashion, but I am now just to give you a, a, another example. In other words, you can achieve what you want to achieve as long as you're willing to make the effort to go and find what it is you need to find. But if your whole attitude is, is that you're going to go inside a retail store and say, okay, yeah, well, I want to, you know, do great photography in the sense of this, that, or the other portraiture, we'll say for the sake of the conversation here, I'm going to do great portraiture photography, but I, you know, I just can't see myself spending for that camera. That's going to be good. You know, that 2,500 or, you know, whatever it's going to cost. I want to go with this unit over here. That's 500 bucks. And then I'll work my way up to that $2,500 camera total lie. But anyways, you say it anyways, just because you don't want to shell out the money, then, then you're in the wrong scenario in the first place. Because if, if someone can't explain to you why you need to spend the 2,500, you're talking to the wrong person. Number one, number two, if the person isn't good enough to say, okay, you know what? You can't deal with the $2,500 price point because of financial reasons, whatever they might be. Okay. So let's say that you are, a, you know, a young lady working at McDonald's part-time. Okay. And you've been able to scrounge up, you know, a good, we'll say five to a thousand dollars, five to a thousand dollars. Let's say you were able to scrounge up that much 
and, and you go into a store or a camera store and you say, you know what? I want to, I want to, I want to start doing portraiture and I want to get myself into it. Okay. And you're talking to the guy and the guy says, look, you know what? This is based on what you're saying. You want this Canon 5D Mark III over here. <laughs> okay. We'll just say that you want that. And, 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 you know, the girl looks at it and says, ah, you know what? This is, uh, this is, uh, this is way more than what I can afford. You know, I've only got like 500 to a thousand that I can, I can do here. Um, and, and when we're talking 500 to a thousand, we're talking some graduation money being thrown in there too. Okay. So let's say she's really looking up on this to this thousand point. So, you know, the guy looks at it and says, okay, if you can't do this right here, then let me give you a suggestion here. Okay. In the end, I said, you need to buy this 5D Mark III. That 5D Mark III doesn't even count a lens for that 2,500. So what you probably need to do is this. Why don't we scale back some of these features on this 5D Mark III, but give you the, the, the core fundamentals of what this camera is all about. And what we can do here at the store is we can sell you this lens that's going to work for you, but you need to go on Amazon or you need to go wherever because we don't have it in our inventory and you need to get this camera right here because this camera here is what's going to work for you to do what you want to do. See, honesty is a bitch, okay? Honesty is a bitch. If it doesn't hurt, it usually isn't the truth, okay? And that's where I'm coming from with this, <laughs> which is when you're talking about older, you know, tech versus newer tech, you can use newer tech as a platform to start off with, to understand and be inspired by, this is what I'm aiming for right here. But if you can't get to that point, then you have to look throughout the life cycles of that given lineup and say, okay, under that scenario of that 5D whatever, what can I drop down to that's going to give me the, the core fundamentals of what I'm looking for from it? So like, for example, if you were talking portraiture, I'd say, well, here's what you can do. Go get yourself a Nikon lens for, you know... 200 uh you know 400 dollars and then go out and buy yourself a fuji you know s5 pro or an s3 pro that's what you do boom right there you you already got the the overall you know portraiture in fact you've excelled past what canon was going to offer you anyways now you may lose out here here and here but you got to keep in mind you've only got so much money you know and, and that means you're gonna have to think around the box for these other things but what you are going to get is you are going to get the skin tones. You are going to get the colors, the saturation, the skin tones. You're going to get the, the truest performance or the truest, the truest output that you could possibly get without breaking the bank. So older gear can work for you. Even if it's used, it can still work for you as long as you know what you're doing. Now, I'm not necessarily a believer of, of swapping out glass from one camera to another, because you can come up with, you can end up, you know, breaking cameras doing that through, I want to say, firmware issues and, and, and stuff like that. Alter, alter, alternating, you know, lenses on different camera bodies, you can alternate, you know, or lock up firmware, uh, f firmware programming on cameras. I've seen that before, so I wouldn't do that. But my, my point as to what I'm saying here is for... The person who wants to start off and for the person who cannot see themselves spending, you know, 1500 or more for the person who feels more comfortable at that five ish range, a, you're going to have to still spend more than 500 bucks. B, if you want to do it right, you got to go a couple years back. Okay. Probably before 2010 <laughs> and then pick your out, pick yourself out something that's going to be really good. Okay, if you're talking a five hundred dollar price point. So, so we 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 talked about that. Okay, now a person maybe be listening to this and saying to themselves, "Okay, Doug, all right, so so I totally get it. Okay, so there are technological perspectives that you can go with super CCD, HR, which would obviously be da da da, Fuji, Foveon system, Sigma. But what happens if I want to go with something mainstream?" What happens if I want to have something that's going to have a reasonable output is going to be more leveled when it comes to low light shooting. 
and I still want to be able to deal skin tones. <laughs> okay, this is where the challenge comes into play. This is where the challenge comes into play, and this is where most people fall flat. This is where they always fall flat. It's always funny, too, to watch them fall flat. Okay. Because they don't find out they fall flat until they run into somebody who actually knows what they're talking about, and they get schooled, and then it's like, oh, you know, oh, I spent all this money on this gear, and it doesn't do what I, no wonder it doesn't do what I want it to do. Okay, so, like I said, I get asked about skin tones all the time, and remember what I told you guys. I shoot with, you know, Fuji, um, but I also shoot with Pentex. So, Pentex provides a third kind of option, and this option is a very interesting option. Because the cool thing about Pentex is this, is they provide controllability. That's what they go after. Get, they go after you mastering your craft. What I love most about the Pentex camera series is that they give you basically a control system to work from where you actually set the parameters of the image whether it's the sharpness, whether it's the hues, whether it's the saturation, whether it's the contrast, whether it's the exposure. The reason why this is important as we're talking about, you know, essentially cameras here, the reason why this is important for, for, for what we're talking about is because effectively, if you really want to become a master when it comes to skin tones, and if you're wanting to do it in a way where you're not relying on quote unquote technology, but you're just dealing with a fine tuned camera instead, Pentex is the brand that you go to for that. Hands down, Pentex is the brand of camera that you go to for that. Now, the reasoning to why I tell you this is A, because it's actually true, because I own a Pentex K20D and I love it. It is phenomenal. Um, I still can't let it go. <laughs> I try so hard, but I can't do it. Um, and, and, I, and I have a Pentex K01, you know, which is my, is my trophy camera. It's nothing I use for anything heavy. It's just the trophy camera. I love, it's ISO output, amazing. And anytime I really do want to shoot with it, I can go out and shoot with it, uh, and, and it, and it does a good job, but mechanically it sucks because it was a toy. It was a toy when it was created. That that's all it was. And I totally admit it, but it's really, really good at what it does. Um, and then of course, uh, I've used, you know, like the Pentex K5, uh, K5, K5 2S, uh, you know, I, I've used quite a few, you know, uh, Pentex models before. And um, I've, I've dealt with and consulted with a lot of people uh, that have invested in Pentex, and it has worked out for them very, 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 very well. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm honestly not biased about it. It's just I know it works. I know Pentex works. Pentex works extremely well. And the thing is, is that they can work for virtually anybody. You know, they're not like an icon or a Canon where they, they can work for a certain segment of customers. I had a woman one time um, that I had to, had to deal with a long time ago and uh, she had a stroke and she kept talking to me about this Nikon and Canon in business and I'm looking at her and I'm looking at the camera and her, and, you know, through the conversation, um, she steps away and her husband says, listen, um, he's like, I'm, I'm quite sure you can probably tell. She can't use, you know, the right side of her, the right side of her arm. So is this, is this really going to work? And I looked at him and I said, no, it's not going to work. I said, but I know a camera that can work for. Okay. And of course, then we got into, I think it was a Pentex, uh, like K30. I think that's what I, what I suggested it was a Pentex K30. And I suggested like a, uh, a 16 to 70 millimeter lens or whatever. Right. And she, long story short, she was blown away. I mean, totally blown away. She was so diehard. Uh, I believe it was Canon at the time. She was so diehard Canon. And 
the reality was she was looking at some Canon, like uh, I believe it was like a 60 D I want to say it was a 60 D, but I, I looked at her, the stroke was obvious and it wasn't going to happen. It just wasn't. And, and, and I didn't pick any bones about it because in the end, you know, I, I don't need someone saying, Hey, you know, we listened to you and your stuff fell through. And that, that was a complete waste of our time and our money, you know, but what I did was I said, look, Pentex will be the way to go. And here's going to be the reason why. And, and the reason why Pentex works so well from a, you know, uh, camera perspective is they're really good as a system. And that's what makes them different from what I've talked about so far. So far I've talked about Fuji technology, you know, um, Sigma technology. But now when we start to looking at, looking at cameras, we're not going to talk about a system. And this is where Pentex comes out to be very, very good because they use, you know, of course their, their Pentex, you know, K system. And what's nice about the K system is the K system essentially allows you to wield. It literally allows you to wield the, the properties of the imaging sensor in terms of output in a seamless fashion right down to the point where a one arm person can do it. That is how good they are. You know, and it, it, it's not the same experience that you get from an icon or Canon. It is not. Um, and it comes down to a couple of factors. Uh, the first thing is this. Pentex does open up the internals of the camera in terms of how you relate to understanding the imaging processing system, which is in the ability to control the hues, the sharpness, the, um, the, uh, the saturations and all those things. Um, but even going beyond that in a post processed arena, the Pentex system is the best system out there like literally with the Pentex system and about the only other system that will match it would be Samsung. You can literally post process all your images on your camera and never use a computer. And post processing wise, their system output is about, I would say equal to that of Corel paint shop pro. I'd say it's on the same level as that just doing comparison to comparison. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's, that's how good it is. Now, you know, some people are going to sit up here and listen and say, well, you know, you know, I, I can, I can alternate my contrast and my, you know, my, my saturations and things like that with Canon. I can do it with Nikon. I can do it with Sony. And here's what I'm going to say. Okay. For those people who use Nikon, I'll start with them because they're, they're, they are the easiest ones to deal with. Have you ever tried to sit up here and mess with your tonal balance on an icon? Have you ever tried that before? Yeah, it's some weird stuff. You know, you're set up in a situation where with half the Nikon cameras out there, you have to go through a main menu to a sub menu. And then in doing that, you've got this like weird, you know, graph chart. You don't get to see anything that you're actually shooting. So when you shift it over to, to, you know, one area, you get one result. Then you try to shift it over to another area, you get another result. You don't have time for that kind of stuff. You don't have time for that kind of stuff. And the biggest problem with something like a Nikon, for example, is it does terrible when it tries to understand that, you know, blues are blues and purples are purples. You know, it ends up confusing the two of them or meshing them together. It tries to go for an absolutist system and it, and it doesn't work when it comes to certain colors and certain ranges, you know, and this is going back as far as like the Nikon D 90 days, you know, so this is nothing new for them. What I'm talking about and for Canon, just no, 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 no. And, and let me stress to why Canon doesn't work really well. The reason why Canon doesn't work really well is because their attitude is, Let's use a pie chart. Essentially let's, let's use a little circle, cut it in half and then use that as our indicator for how much you got of this or how much you got of that. That's how they, they used to do stuff. 
you know, again, just not a really good way of doing things. Now, occasionally what happens is you find that magical setting, like maybe it's, it's faithful or, or whatever it is on the camera, you know, um, and you get that quote unquote true output, but you don't, and you want to know why you don't. It's because it's pre-programmed in the camera. And with Canon, it is already a known fact that they oversaturate their whites and they oversaturate their blues. They overplay those colors on their color palette. Therefore, no matter how faithful you want to get about it, it's not getting those colors right from a saturation perspective. Okay. And again, these are things I've already tested, so I know them as a fact. So how does Pentex differ? How, how do... How do these guys come up with a system that works in a way that other manufacturers haven't been able to make it work? And even though other manufacturers have these abilities, why is it they aren't known for these abilities? And why is it that Pentex is superior in these given categories? Here's the first thing. Pentex has done it longer than the other manufacturers. Number one. First and foremost. Number two. When Pentex designs a camera system, they design a camera system that has the input of photographers. That's what they do. Canon is now getting to a point where they're starting to send out surveys to people to say, what would you like to see in a Canon 5D Mark IV? Now they should have figured this stuff out a long time ago because that, camera, that Canon 5D Mark III has been around for a while, but they're now getting to a point where they're now starting to talk to their consumers to figure out what they want to see in their cameras. You know, and, and Nikon just is a brand that doesn't want to change. It's a brand that literally their whole attitude is we rebuild the same thing over, over and over again. And we fix, you know, camera issues in the way of making brand new cameras to replace older camera models. That, that's their methodology. So they don't have a really great progression over time when it comes to camera development. Now, the irony is this. Nikon packs their cameras with a ton of features. They do that. But they're just drowned out in submenu systems. And by the time you start screwing around with the submenu systems, you're like, whoa, wait a second here. I even forgot what I was trying to do. So let's bring it back to Pentex in this conversation. Okay. So where Pentex comes out strong is this, is that their system is surface-based. It is a surface-based system. What they do is they were the first brand of camera to actually understand the live view system. In other words, they were doing essentially mirrorless camera performance in terms of technology before mirrorless ever even was invented. What they did is they combined the concepts of a point and shoot with a DSLR. And what they would do is they would have a system where, like with the K20D, you could use the LCD screen as a live view system so you could actually set up the proper color compositional elements of the photo that you were going to take. That means that I'm able to, comp like when I go to use my Pentex K20D, I'm able to set my saturations in a way where I know it's going to favor, we'll say the skin tones of my portraiture subject versus favoring, we'll say more of a, a washed out evenization of everything. Or what I'm able to do is I'm able to tool it where maybe I shift the, the hue slightly over to the right. I shift the saturation slightly over to the left. I down the exposure a little bit. And what I'm able to do is I'm able to get definitive subject matter through the given color system that looks natural to me in the environment that I'm actually in. In other words, I'm able to take the picture as I see it, or I'm able to get as close as I can to getting the color system down in the way that I see it. But it goes beyond that. 
because what you're also able to do, of course, is you're able to control things like high key and low key on certain cameras and what have you not. So what you're able to do is you're able to control essentially, not only I want to say the, uh, the light metering parameters of things, but what you're able to do is you're really able to draw out whether you're going to have true shadows or whether you're going to essentially eliminate shadows. while still retaining the true color integrity of your actual image. And by color integrity, I'm talking about your, your hues, your saturations, you know, your, your given tones and what have you not, keeping all those things in check. What makes them such an amazing brand and the reason why they do great when it comes to portraiture is because you can shoot it right every single time and you don't have to necessarily rely on photoshop to get the job done because as you're actually photographing and you're setting up what the the you know tones or the exposure or you know the the high key versus the low key uh, as you're setting all those things up, you know, your saturations and whatnot, what happens is this, is you're cutting out a certain level of workflow that you have to do in post-process. But the other thing is this, that makes them an amazing brand to actually shoot with. And one of the reasons why they do as well as they do is that when it comes to post-processing with them as a brand, they do a phenomenal job of post-processing the image in the way the camera sees it. So you can like literally with a Pentex go into a situation and get the perfect shot. You can do that if you want to put the work into it. You can do it. I'm talking, get the shot, first time around, no ands or buts, and bam, there you go, end of story, that's that. But of course, sometimes when you throw that perfect shot into a photo editing program, what happens? Well, the photo editing program reinterpretates it the way it sees it, and then sometimes things don't turn out the way that you want them to turn out. Well, what's nice about Pentex and the way that they work is that when you nail that perfect shot, you can output that perfect shot in a TIFF or convert it over to a JPEG or save it as a DNG, depending on, you know, your, your, the camera type that you got, you know, you can do these things and you don't have to worry about what's, what's going to be what. You know, and you can also do it from the standpoint of, you know, colored filters or, you know, black and white filters, whether you want to use a red filter or a blue filter or green, you know, a magenta, you know, a blue, a cyan, you can do these kind of things. Use a black filter or I should say graphite filter. You can do this kind of stuff. So. You know, imagine you want to you want to do a a black and white shoot. Okay, let's say you want to do a black and white shoot with uh, you know, and and you're shooting with Pentex. Well, what happens is this: is you can do your black and white shoot, but you don't have to shoot with just a straight monochrome. You don't got to do that. I mean, who wants to do that? That always sucks, anyways. You can shoot high contrast. You can shoot low contrast. Those things are true. You can do those things, but also what you're able to do is you're able to throw the filter type on there that's going to work best for you. So maybe a red filter in, in the scenario that you're in actually brings out the subject matter's eyes. And that's the main thing you're going after. Maybe the green filter gives them an even color tone, gives them an even color tone so that they're not too harsh. Maybe a blue filter, what it does is it adds a high dynamic effect to the skin tones while still bringing out the eyes. You see where I'm coming from with this. This is the key 
to their success when it comes to photography. When you talk about skin tones, when you talk about portraiture, and if you're looking at a scenario <coughs> and you're saying that you, you're you going to make an investment in something, but you're, you're looking at, you know, the reality of, okay, I like the idea of the Fuji in their, you know, super CCD sensor, but you know, six megapixels, man, I got to have something more than six megapixels. And although, yeah, I can shoot 12 megapixels, it's, I still got to have something more than that. You may look at something like the Sigma and you say, oh, wow, I love the output of this kind of system. I love the idea of, of, you know, of course, you know, 14 megapixels, I can totally deal with the resolution, yada, 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 so on and so forth. Below light shooting, I got to do better than an 800 ISO. Okay. Then of course, again, you want to move on to something else because that's just not going to work. So then you get to Pentex. And where Pentex changes is this. A, you can have the resolutional output that you need. Not a problem. B, you have the ability to control low lit and well lit situations from a coloring balancing system. So you know through the process of being able to manipulate your hue, saturation, and you know uh, your exposures right on a fly, by the way, right on the fly, you already know when you step into a well lit situation, you can, you know crank the saturation up a little bit you can you know do whatever you want to do on the exposures end you can shift the hues over slightly to give it a more you know gentle uh tone in the way more of shall we say uh a fleshy type feel versus a uh i'd say a, a polar uh, a polar polar uh polarizing effect uh feel you can do those kind of things if that's what you want to do. You know, the, the, the choice is yours and how you want to do that. You know, you have the ability to reset the very structural imaging elements of what makes the image the actual image to the degree that the camera will allow you to do. And it's all up to you on how you do this. And this is what makes them amazing. But also flip it over and go into a low lit situation. And maybe you are in a situation where you're shooting at an ISO of 13, or I'm sorry, 3200 or 6400, in fact. And you realize as you're shooting in that ISO that if you want to save, you know, the, the given integrity of, of what you're shooting, you got to dial that saturation quite a bit back, you know. And maybe you have to lower you know, the, uh, the exposure somewhat, you know, or, or maybe what you got to do is you've got to lower the saturation, but increase the exposure. And that's what saves your, you know, your tonal aspects of colors in terms of image and what also allows you to have that that image that you want in that given environment with its natural lighting, so on and so forth. You know, this is what they do that nobody else does in the way that they do it. You know, now don't get me wrong. There are other brands that do a great job at, at camera systems. There are, but nobody does it like Pentex. You know, the advantage to Fuji is the fact that Fuji, for example, is a brand that relies heavily on technology. And basically they take everything that Pentex is and they slap it into the sensor and say, okay, we can take you on, but we can do it one shot around with minimal effort. That's the whole idea behind Fuji system. It's all about one shot, minimal effort. Pentex, you're going to put the effort into it because you're going to get exactly what you want out of it. And that's the thing. You don't take that shot until you know it looks the way you want it to look. And in some situations, you know, what you end up realizing is you got to give up one color 
or one tone in order to save all the rest. So you may be in a situation, for example, and I've seen this before with my K20D, where let's say that I'm, I, for the sake of the conversation, I remember this a long time ago when I was doing this test shot, uh, Peter Pan, you know, peanut butter uh, jar. Just curious to see what the K20D would do with it. So I wanted to nail down the yellow exactly and precisely as the yellow. And I did that. But my red was a little off. You know, and I mean, like, again, no, you know, this, it's a Pentex system I'm talking here. This isn't a Fuji system I'm talking here. So I don't look at its quote unquote color balance as the primary thing. Although the Pentex system, by the way, does have an excellent color balance. It does actually. It, it, it's a really good color balance, you know, but in order to nail that yellow as deep and as distinctive as it was on, you know, the camera, as I saw it right in front of my face, to alternate, to make those alterations, which I did, you know, the, the red was a little off. It was a little off. Now, that may bother some people, didn't bother me, because the red wasn't the main, the, uh, the main focus of what I was doing. You know, now on the flip side of that, you know, if, if I wanted to go for something that was hard red, like a candy apple red or a cherry red or something like that, I could do that with the Pentex and that wasn't a problem. I would just have to simply see what shifts within the image and what other alteration I would have to make to correct that shift. And this is what's so great about their system is that you can shift one thing, see how it alters other things, and then go back and make another shift to try to correct or try to neutralize what you may find to be unpleasant. Nine times out of 10 though, you don't care. You just don't care. It's how it works. But the reason why this system is important is because when you're talking about portraiture and skin tones, you with, with a Pentex system, you literally get to deal with portraiture and skin tones in the purest form. The first thing is this. They use an auto white balance corrector. What's really cool about using an auto white balance corrector is this. You don't got to fumble around with white balance in order to get the shot right. That The camera is going to do it for you. That's one of the things I love about Pentex cameras is their auto white balance correctors. What I also love about Fuji cameras, auto white balance correctors. What I hate about Canon and Nikon, they have real shitty auto white balance correctors provided they even have an auto white balance corrector. But with Pentex, you do have an auto white balance corrector, number one. Number two, because you have an auto white balance corrector, you don't necessarily need to worry about white balance affecting skin tone, which means that you're able to deal with skin tonage versus exposure. And what have I just spent the last, we'll say 15 to 20 minutes talking to you about? It's about being able to manipulate color and contrast based on, you know, the exposures or dynamic exposures, I should say, in a given scenario. This is what Pentex allows you to do. Now, for those of you who are wondering, okay, so why do, why do I bring them up in this conversation uh, versus the other two, meaning the Fuji and the Sigma? Again, it's about a camera system. In other words, if you want a strong camera system that allows you to control these things, they're who you go to. That are probably Samsung. But we're not going to talk about Samsung today because they ripped it off of Pentex originally anyways. Um, uh, but they're the ones you go to. But also it's price for performance. So again, you know, I went through a conversational piece today where I talked about that, that photographer who doesn't want to spend the money but wants to become, you know, the great, the next great thing, essentially. That's what they want to do. 
you know, and, and, you know, for that person who's going to be listening to this, cause you know who you are, you want to become a great photographer, but you don't want to put the money into it. Um, and it will be for whatever reasons you want to. Again, I'm not a person who buys into the line of you buy crappy gear to learn how to use crappy gear so that you'll move on to better gear. That doesn't make any sense to me. And this is what makes Pentex different as a brand versus other brands, which is for the prices that you, you pay for their stuff. You don't get crappy gear. You actually don't. Now you do definitely get added benefits as you move on up the line. But it, I'd explain it like this. You go with something like the Pentex uh, KS2. That's a current model through, you know, within the Pentex lineup. You can get it for under 500 bucks. Okay. Modern camera, by the way, modern camera. I've talked about older cameras. Of course, I'm talking about modern cameras now, but you can get it under uh, 500 bucks essentially. Now, this camera here comes with a minus three exposure. Number one, total plus. Number two, it comes with the coloring system that I, I was talking about. Number three, um, the camera has up to a, I believe, I want to say about a 5100 ISO, 50, 51, 5200 ISO range. That's what you got going on there. Okay. Now, usable ISO, I wouldn't go that far. I'd probably say about 32 to 64 ish would be usable ISO range and it's, it's 20 megapixels shoots like 5.5 frames a second or whatever. And it has it's Oh, and it's focusing, it's focusing speed. I'd say almost equivalent to that of the Canon five D Mark three. So on focusing the camera's spot on. All right. The reason why I bring up that as your third um, option here. If we're not talking about, you know, technology in terms of CCD, if we're not talking about, you know, technological optimization in terms of, um, what Sigma would provide, and we're talking more of a more balanced system, then we go to Pentex. The reason why I bring them up is because you could do that. If you wanted to a camera like that for under 500, you could do a K 20 D if you wanted to under 500, if you want to do that, you do a, uh, a Pentex K five phenomenal camera. You could do that if you wanted to. You take any one of those cameras that you want to. I mean, honestly, I wouldn't care. You're still going to be able to nail down the skin tones. You're still going to be able to do the skin tones the way you want to. And again, this is from a guy who has real experience with it. Once when you start shooting with a Pentex, by the way, you develop a relationship with your camera where you're not going back. Now I do still shoot with Fuji. I have a love with Fuji and Fuji does have a mystique about them that makes Fuji Fuji. But I'll definitely tell you that Pentex has a level of professionalism where you own the shot. And that's the whole thing. If you want to be in control of the skin tones, if you want to own the skin tones, if you want to own what it is, then you can. But the last thing I want to bring up in, in, in this part of uh, today's conversation is this. Think about what I said in the very beginning about, you know, the dark chocolate and the white chocolate, how dark chocolate always wants to become lighter and white chocolate always wants to become darker. How do you think you're going to control those things and make them look good? Hmm? This is the kind of system that can allow you to do so. Now I'll be honest with you. I don't waste my time doing that with my Pentex. I wouldn't do that. But my point is this. If you are, are really trying to go for a camera that is essentially going to give you that ability to manipulate uh, to a, to whatever degree you want to, or to a lesser degree, at least, you know, skin tones and how they can be perceived, quite frankly, yeah, you really do have to go with, uh, or you should look at, I should say, um, Pentex as a serious option. And what I mean by that is this, is that. if you want to go for a more purist look, okay. And what I mean is, you know, you think about that, uh, you know, the, um, the, uh, the Irish girl, uh, with, you know, red hair and, uh, or a Scottish girl with red hair either, or, you know, in, in the pale white, you know, you know, the pale white skin, if you want to be able to hit that pale white skin, if you want to hit that, that, um, that, uh, that kind of, we'll say, you know, um, undertone, if you want to do that, and if you want to do it accurately, then of course, you know, 
that's the brand. Pentex is the brand that you that's going to ensure that you can do it. You know, they're going to be able to ensure that you get get the job done. And that's one of the things I like about them as a brand. And that's one of the things that I believe makes them such a great brand. I also think though, um, that that post processing capability is what it's all about because you never know when you go through a shoot and you say, ah, you know what? I thought it looked great one way, but now looking at it, I think it just makes it, it's just more dynamic in terms of being black and white than it is color. But then when you start looking at black and white, you know, you don't want to monochrome everything because you know what happens when you just do a straight monochrome of everything. Everything just looks looks lame. So what do you want to do? You want to use filters or you want to you want to combine. You know, like, for example, maybe you want to combine a high key slash a low key element with your. With, of course, um, you know, your your monochrome. And maybe you do throw another filter on top of it. If that's what you want to do, that's what you can do. Or maybe you want to go with a red filter, but you want to have more dynamic contrast. So that's what you do. Now, if you're really good with what you're doing, you're going to know that going right into the gate. So let's say that I do want to shoot in a scenario where I want to shoot in black and white. And I want to use a red filter, green filter, whatever, but I also want to have dynamic contrast. In other words, I'm using, I may be wanting to use noise, ISO noise as an element of my photo, which really brings out the element in terms of the skin tones that I'm trying to go after so on and so forth. Because sometimes it's not so much the skin tone itself in terms of color, but it's in terms of the texture. So maybe you want to go for a softer texture. Like for example, you're photographing a baby and of course you don't want the baby to look all, you know, um, you know, uh, just look, uh, exhausted. You know, you don't want the baby looking exhausted. You know, um, you don't want the baby looking like it's coming out of a third world, you know, thir third world photo, you know? So what do you do? Y you want to go for, a softer, gentler tone in terms of actual texture. And that could be brought about by various filters and stuff like that. But at the same time, you may want to have a high contrast effect. Again, filter exposure, meaning in this case, contrast, you know, control. And Again, Pintex is the brand that can do that all within a couple adjustments. Talking like three adjustments there. Boom, it's done. And you know exactly what every single picture is going to look like. And that's what makes them who they are, is you can believe in the camera. You can believe once when you set it, that's how it's going to be. That camera is only going to make a mistake if you make a mistake. But it's not going to be making any mistakes if you didn't make a mistake. This is what makes them who they are. And this is what makes them such a great system. It's what makes them a great system. You know, so whether you're talking about, you know, a, uh, a pre-production process, meaning that essentially you're going to, to get it right the first time around in terms of a shoot, uh, or you're talking a post-production process, whether you're going to, you know, sit at home and take a couple hours and go through a whole bunch of photos. The camera is very flexible both ways. Now, um, what I would also point out is this, is that with the Pintex system, um, part of it comes down to workflow. And one of the things that I really do enjoy about their system is workflow. If you are a beginning, again, we go to this concept of a beginning photographer. Uh, and we'll probably get into this conversation in the next episode uh, of, of our skin tones. Okay. Yeah. So we still got like one or two episodes left. I don't know. It might not be this up now. It might, might not be the next episode, but it will definitely be the episode afterwards. If it's not the next one, um, is post-production. So you really do have to ask yourself, do you want to spend hours at a computer? doing post-production do you and of course you got to compare this to 
the concepts of time versus pay. You know, I mean, are you getting paid decently enough to be there for a couple of hours? Are you? Maybe you are, or maybe you're not. You know, if you want to cut down on your post-production, like in other words, let's say that you want to basically do the Polaroid effect, meaning you, you, you take some pictures and then you want to do straight prints. Then again, the Pentex system is the way to go. It's the way to do it. Because remember, you can already preset the camera to everything you need it set to, take your pictures, bam, and then after that, what can you do? Well, you can print them off. I did that before. Uh, I, and I've done more than once, I should say. But, but no, I, I did that before where I, I had spent um, with, my, with my, uh, my son, I'd spent like four days at the hospital. I did all these shots. Everybody wanted to see some pictures, right? And, and I hadn't done anything yet. So what I did was I said, here, wait a second. And I literally just went to the Pentax camera just because of how I shot them. I did a quote unquote, you know, pre-production setup. So because I had shot them the way I did, um, I was able to simply, you know, take the SD card out, pop it into the computer and then bam, there you go. I spit them all out. It was done. It was over for the ones that I wanted to. The second batch I actually edited right on the camera um, for the ones that I wanted just to give a different effect to and then printed them off again and said, here you go. This is what they are. That's what I did. It was that simple. You know, and this is before they ever even touched a computer. Because sometimes you just get yourself in situations where you have a shoot and you're not trying to, you're, you're not trying to, you know, after the fact of the shoot, waste your time. You're not trying to waste your time at a computer for three or four hours trying to see if everything turned out okay. And true to form, the Pentex came through. It really came through. So I hope you guys get the gist of where I'm coming from here today. Um, you know, the main thing that you got to look at in the conversation of today, dealing with, you know, primarily the concept of skin tones and stuff like that, is when you go to make the purchase of your gear, this is more about the gear purchase. There are a couple of things that you need to look at. Uh, for the actual purchasing process itself. The first thing is, do you want to base it off of technology? And what kind of technology do, do you want? And there are two types of technologies that exist, um, primarily. You have maximum resolutional output, like something like a, a Sigma, you know, where literally resolution and basically well at exposures within a well at exposure, your dynamics are going to be the end all be all. And it is all about accuracy. You know, um, d don't get it twisted here. Uh, the Pentex is good. It's not Sigma good. Okay. <laughs> it's not that, you know, it, it, it's not, and no camera is Sigma is Sigma and that's just that. Uh, or do you go after something that is more, professionalized in terms of body style and is able to cover a wider range while still giving you superior color accuracy while diminishing resolutions to, to achieve these goals. Again, that would be your, your Fuji. Um, and that's the difference between super CCD, which is what Fuji has and Foveon, which is what, um, which is what, uh, uh, Sigma has, or do you go more after a camera system where you deal more with a conventional cam camera sensor still cropped in, in, in all three scenarios we're talking about, but the system itself is the defining factor. Like the system itself is, is what defines how much, you know, noise suppression you're going to have. And I'm not talking about noise suppression through using noise reduction. That's, that's what idiots do. No, I'm not talking about that. What I'm talking about is noise suppression through calibrating better exposures, through shifting your saturations over to a more meaningful setup, through, you know, lowering or widening the range of contrast and things like that. If you're about, like, if you, if you want to become a pro, 
and you want to make things easier on yourself, learn that stuff. And that's where the pen tech system comes into play. That's where it comes into play. So again, I'm not trying to advocate for pen techs in this conversation. Uh, I love Sigma. I almost bought one of their cameras. Just can't get past that, that low light thing. Um, but I will give them credit where credit's due. Uh, I have, I've dealt with Sigma on a number of occasions and anybody who ever talks to me about it and says, Hey Doug, would you do this? I'm like, yeah, as long as you don't care about the low light thing. And, um, I've had people who have had Sigmas before they kind of got irritated at the low light, you know, scenario thing. And then they go and make an investment into, you know, a Canon or an icon and right away they're going back to the, to, to the Sigma. Like once, when you get that in your blood, you know, um, something like the Foveon processor, it's really tough to take out. It, it really is. Um, cause there is no real uh, duplication for it, you know, and, and you know that, and you know, you have a unique jewel. Um, and, and the same thing for the Fuji, <coughs> we've already talked about Fuji, but remember with Fuji, people who buy Fuji's a lot of time, uh, most of the time, in fact, they, they don't give them up. I know people have been shooting for Fuji's for years and, and they're still not giving them up. And then of course there's Pentex. Okay. My, my K 20 D case in point, I'm not giving that sucker up. Uh, and it's the system. It's the system. Stupid. It's the system. Y you have that kind of system. And what that does for you is that allows you to shoot at a level that most other photographers that are non Pentex photographers cannot shoot at. And that's what makes Pentex so amazing. So w again, w when, you know, when people come to me and talk to me about skin tones, they talk about portraiture and skin tones with me. I start to half the time I laugh because the reason why they can't achieve what they're trying to achieve and they watch me achieve it is because they're using the wrong gear. That's what they're doing. You know, and, and that goes back to the second conversation about what I talked about. You know, it's, it's all about what can't other manufacturers do for you and why shouldn't you go with them? So in this episode, what, what do we talk about here? Uh, you know, we talked about why Canon just doesn't do that good when it comes to skin tones yet again, and why Canon as a camera, they're, they're good, but they're definitely not necessarily the best when it comes to portraiture. You know, we talked about, you know, uh, their absolutist, you know, color system that in, ter in terms of an icon, we talked about that with him and how that really does hurt them and how they use a sub menu system that just, that's just awful. You know, we talked about Canon and their menu system too. And then of course, then we talked about, you know, Pentex in relation, you know, this, and, and understand today's conversation was not about, you know, who has the best ISO performance for the money who has the best lens assortment for the price. It wasn't any of that stuff. It was basically camera systems. Like in other words, you have to navigate through the camera and work the camera. What makes the most amount of sense. Now you can always remember that based on this conversation, you don't have to worry about all that stuff. If you go with a Fuji or you go with a Sigma, they have that stuff down pat because their sensors are so vastly superior, but where Pentex comes out ahead is this it's technology and cost versus operation and control. If you've ever owned a Fuji, you know, their menu systems as basic as it gets. It's so basic, except for Sigma that it makes you want to cry. And the reason why it's basic like that is because they do put all of their eggs in the sensor basket and it, it totally works. You look at Sigma. If you've ever used a Sigma, you know that dude, they're, their menu system is not even worth, worth even talking about. Yeah. You know, I'm not going to talk about it. it. It's, it's very basic, but again, Sigma would say, Hey, you know what? We may have a basic sensor system, but guess what? You know what else we've got? Arguably the best sensor on the market, you know, depending on how you want to define best in this case. And then you've got Pentex. Pentex says, Hey, you know what? We use the same thing that everybody else uses, but this is how we're able to maximize it. And they do maximize it through the control system. 
something that nobody else does, and something that nobody else can really go up against. So there you go. Okay, so uh, next episode, uh, what are we going to do? We're going to do one of two episodes, um, because we're, we're, we're winding down here on skin tones. Uh, I might do post-processing, um, because I know that's what a lot of people probably have been waiting for this entire time, is like, this guy really spent four episodes talking essentially about skin tones and not even mentioning post-processing as a real topic yet. Uh, it, I might do five actually. Um, because there is one more category to talk about with skin tones and that is a fine tuned camera. Um, and, and, but that, that's a, that, that's, that's a topic in and of itself that we'd have to talk about. We can't, we, we can't work that into any of the other topics we've had <clears throat> or I might jump right to literally post-processing. Um, but you got to remember what I told you. I told you at the beginning of this conversation um, that there are certain things that would blow your mind in terms of talking about skin tones. And you can see how much depth goes into understanding the concept of being able to photograph portraiture and skin tones in a way that makes sense. You can now begin to see, <clears throat> sorry, how this, this all takes place. And these are the kind of conversations I have day in and day out when I'm dealing with photography. This is, this is, you know, and whenever, and whenever I go to shoot or do a shoot, these are the kind of things that I look at. So you've got to understand here that like, from my perspective, it, it doesn't start with a post-processing aspect because as you've seen so far, we've been in the understanding the subject we've moved on to the capturing phase and now we're about to head into um you know post-processing like i said i'll either do post-processing next or i'll do fi uh you know fine-tuned cameras because there is one more category to go with you know and and, and i think it would be fair to to bring that category up so i'll just decide once when i get there um you know to the next episode uh but you know, it will be what it's going to be. Uh, the main thing though, that I want you guys to take away today is that you got to think of options and you got to think outside the box, you know, and, and to tell you the truth, every option that I've given you so far has been about $500 or below. I realistically haven't hit you with anything expensive yet. Okay. So again, if you are that photographer who wants to deal with skin tones in terms of portraiture, like, like that's one of your big things. Like you've done some portraiture, you've been shooting with your iPhone, you realize the stuff doesn't look right. You're trying to figure out, you know, what kind of camera do I get myself into that is going to be better than a phone? I hate to break it to you. You can't just grab any old camera and it'd be better than your phone. I mean, I, dude, I've seen some, out, I've seen the iPhone out shoot some SLR, so I'm not even going to, you know, play that game. But what I am going to say is this, it can be done. You just need to know where to go to look. Okay. So with that being said, you guys take care. I'll talk to you later. All right. Bye-bye.